Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker betting show. Uh, this is a Cheltenham Festival preview. We are recording in mid-December. Uh, I'm your host, George Ellick, and I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Holding and Ed Quigley as we look ahead to March at Presbury Park. Uh, Ed, you are our local man uh, down by uh, by uh, the Cheltenham Racecourse. Uh, how many months? Is, you normally got the, the countdown of days, haven't you? How long have we got to wait from, from now? I oh, know you've, you've screwed me over there, uh, George. Oh, no. Yeah, you it's normally 90... got your running... oh, no. 92 days. 92, I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought you were going to pin me to the minutes and seconds. Then right. I would have started panicking. I'm normally on top of that. But yeah, uh, not long now, as I like to say. Although, to say, it's uh, just a wall of snow uh, over Charlton Race School at the moment and all around uh, as this cold snap continues. But yeah, it's a, it's a funny old time at the moment, um, George. Just uh, looking at the anti-post markets, there's unusually... So many of them seem very wide open. Uh, I was going back through some of the, like, where we were this time last year and the year before, etc. Uh, race like the Brown Advisory, Novices Chase, go 12 to 1 the field approaching mm. Christmas. I mean, it's almost unheard of. You go back to the previous years, your Monkfishes or your Santinis or your Bobsworths. You know, there was some already one kind of established performer out there at two to one or something. And we were looking for things to try and get them beaten. Here, they've got the feel, feel of kind of, a, you know, 40 runner handicaps at the moment. So anyway, I digress. But um, yeah, nonetheless, what I'm trying to say is doesn't uh, stop me trying to eke out a bit of value and try and find those those lurkers in the pack, shall we say? Well, yeah, the way it is these days, Andy, you know, it might be mid-December and some will scoff at the idea of doing a, a Cheltenham Antipost preview. But A, there is obviously significant value to be had betting Antipost. If you look at the markets as they are today and as they are, um, you know, in mid-March, they are going to be massive price discrepancies as horses have their their you know have their prep runs over the course of the next couple of months and, and now is the time where you can expose that value well this is a, a pretty much a, a mid-season report isn't it i think from, from yeah. myself and ed we're, we're, we're going to kind of highlight the ones who've already run uh to a reasonably good standard and put a marker down for the rest of the season um and we're probably going to be at a point of the season where the sort of next few weeks are going to influence where a lot of the sort of like Willie Mullins horses goes go. So I, I think that Christmas period, particularly at Leopardstown, when Willie unleashes the uh, takes the sheets off quite a few of his big guns, um, if you can sort of preempt how they're going to get on and what kind of category they're likely to run in after they've either run or run well, I think you're going to be getting yourself ahead of the pack. Um, there are a few races, unfortunately, as Ed's pointed out already, that they look have a wide open feel. But at the start of the meeting, when I mean, we've already got Fasel Vega, John Bond, and Constitution Hill in a lot of mm-hmm. Hunter's anti post short price trebles. Um, and given that perhaps two of those craft categories don't look all that deep, um, bookmakers are looking for a, a rescue plan already. Well, yeah, I mean, it's one one bookmaker, Paddy Power, paid out on John Bon already for the article. So, um, so some have had a winner in uh, the Chocolate Festival before we even started. Paid um, out on John Bon already? Seriously? Yeah, yeah, a good bit of marketing, that's isn't it? Yeah, that's just ridiculous. And they, they know what they're doing. Um, yeah, so the way we're going to do this, because there's plenty to get through, um, is we are going to go through day by day, uh, but we're going to ignore the novice hurdles. We're going to ignore the novice chases. So we'll have to wait a bit for the Fasal Vega and John Bon uh, chat on Tuesday. And we're going to ignore the, the handicaps. So we're going to go through the kind of major races, the, the you know, the greater races um, that aren't novice races over, over the course of the four days uh, to start with. And then we're going to go back through the novice hurdle division, through the novice chase division. And then we'll end up with uh, a look at some of the other races where you guys have bit picked out bets as well so plenty to get through it's going to be pretty quick and it is ridiculous how often this happens it seems like every single show we ever do uh, in the national Hunt season starts with a horse called constitution hill because the first race we can cover on the tuesday is the champion hurdle because we'll be saving um, both the supreme and the arkle uh, for later on um, and no bets in the ultimate so we'll be swerving that one but constitution hill is now the four to eleven favorite for the champion hurdle um after Honeysuckle's defeat last weekend. Uh, that is with Unibet. Stateman is the closest mm. challenger at 6-1. to one. Honeysuckle is 10-1. to one. Of course, all of these um, markets and bets, if you download the Odds Checker app, you'll find these best prices there. These are all um, not no run or no bets. So if they don't run, these bets are losers. And, and you know, a fair chance you have to think now that Honeysuckle will go uh, back to the mayor's hurdle, um, which we'll get onto a bit later. But Honeysuckle, 10-1 to one, um, to retain her champion hurdle crown. Uh, Vauban, 12-1. Tiapu, 
Uh, the horse that beat Honeysuckle is 25 to 1, to go hard 25 to 1. Um, and Andy, we'll, we'll start with you here. This At this stage, there aren't really any angles to have here uh, unless you want to maybe have a bet that Constitution Hill won't get to Cheltenham in March. I think that's one of the only um, possibilities this horse won't win the Championers if something goes wrong with him between now and then. Um, I think if you haven't backed Constitution Hill uh, up to now, you've got to ask yourself, why on earth haven't I? Because, like, you know, how much evidence do we need to tell you? Like, from, I, mean, I think literally about two, three weeks afterwards, we were already saying that he was value for champion hurdle at five to two. He's value for the champion hurdle at two to one. Start the season, he's value for the champion hurdle at seven to four, six to four. <laughs> um, and we all said he'll definitely beat Honeysuckle, um, even if Honeysuckle remains in the form she is. And the subsequent events of what happened so far this season have uh, almost gone completely the other way. We didn't expect Honeysuckle perhaps to get beat, but she has. Perhaps she might now be on the wane. Um, and that's at the point when Constitution Hill's going up the top of his curve. So, you know, don't take a genius to work out that he's, um, he's you know, he's, he's, he's probably pretty much got his name engraved on the trophy already. Um, with, with the anticipation of even more to come. And the beauty about Constitution Hill as well, from a, a riding perspective, the performance in the, in the fighting fifth has taken away any issues of how a race needs to be run because if there's no obvious front runner in the race, he'll just go off and boss the race from, from the front. So he's pretty much got everything covered. State man's the only obvious threat, as the market suggests. At least with him, you you have got another horse of untapped potential that has genuinely got, got a, a a really impressive and upwardly mobile CV, and he's also improving at a rapid rate of knots. He's not in Constitution Hill's class for me, but you know he's not a million miles off. But then you know you're looking at perhaps a bet without the favourite, and he's odds on in that market with one firm mm-hmm. of prices up. So you, you know you're not getting great value there. And I think Stateman will probably dominate his division over in Ireland. I think he's the Preeminent force there with with perhaps only Sucker now wanting to duck the issue and maybe go down the the mayor's route. I think connections are probably thinking, hang on a minute, you know, we're, we're, they've they've taken their medicine and, and they're they're regrouping and looking for other options, aren't they, to try and um, get perhaps one more victory at the Channel Festival of Honeysuckle, but I don't think I'll be in the champion hurdle. Um, and then you're looking at the likes of Vauban and a few others. So it, it's a, it's a pretty stagnant market. You know, how short will he get between now and the festival? He's, he's open to debate, but like I say, if, if you've missed all the odds against, you know, you're not going to be going in at one to three unless you might as well wait to the day. And if you're a lumpy punter, then, you know, you have your, 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 big, your big threes on to win one. I mean, there doesn't seem too much point spending too much time on this, but let's just look, look at further ahead for Constitution Hill into the future. This is our first 2024 Cheltenham Festival uh, preview where... <laughs> You know, we had Michael Buckley after um, the, the Supreme win hinting at a dawn run style campaign where go and win the champion hurdle and then set your sights over the bigger obstacles. Where do you think, if Constitution Hill justifies the momentous hype that justifiably surrounds him at the moment, where do you think they go? Who do you think, you know, this time in the year when we're sitting down doing our Cheltenham preview, what race do you think we'll be talking about Constitution Hill for? Will it still be over hurdles? Or do you think there's a chance that they uh, they shoot for the stars? A lot depends on what they kind of see as a as a, as a as competition. Um, a lot depends on what happens in the Gold Cup category. You know, What's the next challenge for a horse like Constitution Hill when it becomes apparent that there isn't anything out for him there in the Champion Hurdle? And, you know, albeit it's great to have a have a uh, a horse of his quality that's only got to go down and come back year in year out and win two or three Champion Hurdles. That's all well and good, you know. And you, you know, we 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 start talking about him in the realms of Easter Bracts and you, you know you see pigeons and night nurses all of this of this ilk, but um, you know it almost becomes a little bit mundane and a bit boring. So to sort of keep the juices flowing and, and keep the interest levels high, they'd probably think, well, we, we need to win the arc all the, the year after because that's the, the natural stepping stone. I wouldn't have thought they'd go down the, you know, the uh, the brand advisory route straight after a champion hurdle year. They'd, they'd probably do like one or two horses who have won the Gold Cup, like a Kicking Kings of this ilk, that have won the, 
the Arkle, and then they, they've stepped up and they've gone through the three mile division the year after, after they've had a year under their belt. So you'd say if they are going to bypass the champion and not look to win it again because of lack of competition, they will go Arkle next year. And then the following year, I think when he's, was he at, will he be eight then? I think they, mm. they'll be thinking about Gold Cups then. So that would be my sort of long term thinking. You'd be looking at 2025 before he's running in a Gold Cup. Any chance, Ed? I mean, firstly, Ed, what do you think? And secondly, any chance they, you know, they bypass the, the novice chase and go straight for the champion chase next year? Oh, I've no idea, to be honest. I mean, I mean, yeah, Dawn Run was about 1 to 14 to win. What was the RSA, wasn't she, when she got in <laughs> yeah. and, and missed it? And then obviously went and won the Gold Cup. But I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't know on, on that. I have no strong view. But um, in regards to this race, uh, I mean, State Man was put up in my, my five to follow when he was 12 to one. I thought I said he'd probably be the protagonist from Ireland. And I think that will end up being the case. If there was an angle in here, I'm always looking for these lurkers. I'd be looking at the uh, on odds checker, the betting without Constitution Hill market. Uh, Pi Piper, 16 to one each way without. Mm. I think this will end up a six runner race. I think, I can't see who's going to line up here. Generally speaking, honestly, at Constitution Hill State Man. Honeysuckle, they're already putting the, the alarm bell flares are going out there. She's going to go back the mayor's route. To Hoopoo, um, the stairs hurdle route, according to Gordon Elliott. Uh, Mighty Potter, Sagerhard chasing. Love Envoy, uh, the mayor's route. Echoes and Rain, the mayor's route. I mean, who's going to turn up? There's no horses left. Vauban is the one you're thinking could really move up a gear. Willie Mullins be very negative on about him. I've seen two interviews he's been pushed on him in the last fortnight. He was very quick to dismiss and move on when he was asked about him two weeks ago. And then I see the quote yesterday uh, after uh, at Cork on Sunday. Uh, it was a bit of an extensive interview where he was asked on a few of his horses, uh, well, quote, we're hoping to have him out at Christmas. I mean, that, that doesn't kind of sound like a horse. You've, you're getting really geared up to win a champion hurdle in 12 and a half weeks time or whatever. You know, we're, we're hoping to see him this year type thing. So all in all, you just start going through process of elimination. Constitution Hill is going to scare everyone off. This is going to be a five-runner champion hurdle. Pied Piper, 16 to 1, each way without. You could literally be looking at him. Um, if it is a four-runner champion hurdle, he's got to get round in those four to collect it, it seven to two a place. So I'm just looking at seven outside the box here. As Andy says, the kind of betting fun has gone out of it. I think Constitution Hill wins by half the track, and it'll just be fun what house happens in behind. Yeah, there yeah, we go. Uh, a, a definitely a good way to play it I am uh, interested there was a, a similar scenario um, last year with the Turners where um, you could back Bustleton each way and then when it got to, without the favourite and then when it got, when we got there it was basically get round and you, and you collect which was, uh, which was handy so that... the other thing is, is on a serious note I mean Pipe Piper is not good enough to win a champion hurdle but it's the only no. race he could possibly run in mm. uh, Gordon Elliott said he's going to have one more run and then we'll run in the race uh, obviously he's run well at Cheltenham before and he's got winning form there he ran a cracker in the triumph uh, and I, I think he'll 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 get there he'll line up in a five runner race and he, he'll he be a viable uh, angle in that market if you know what I'm mm. saying so he's 16 to 1 each way without I don't yeah. think it's the daft daftest bet personally in a race which will cut up <clears> until <throat> five five or six runners and uh, as Andy says Constitution Hill wins and then we really do get the uh the hype overdrive of where we get and as a novice in a gold cup that's what we are. i mean coney Gree did it on his fourth chase start didn't he so uh, <laughs> surely constitution hill could do it the following year <laughs> god let's see uh yeah exciting stuff i think paddy's will be delighted you flagged that one up um with them that uh that that their voban uh sorry pied piper i should say without uh constitution hill in the champion hurdle uh each way the angle for ed um we, we spoke about honeysuckle there we may as well do so in in kind of broader terms here because we'll move on to the mayor's hurdle where honeysuckle is the nine to four favorite ahead of epiton um who bounced back from that defeat uh against constitution hill um five to one brandy love six to one Le- love envoy eight to one marie's rock ten to one uh queen's brook ten to one echoes and rain twelve to one and ed staying with you here you know this for the mes- reasons you mentioned uh should be a fair few turning up here uh swerving constitution hill uh, with Honeysuckle um, coming back into this Division 2. Uh, the prices as they are at the moment, would you be looking to back Honeysuckle at that, at, at 9-4? to four? No, not at all. Not not personally. Uh, it's still with the indecision. Of, essentially, they get, they're going to... There's three things that are going to happen, aren't they? They're going to the Irish Champion Hurdle next time out. If she wins that, she'll probably run in the Champion Hurdle. If she's beaten in the manner in which she was beaten on a seasonal reappearance, she'll run in the Mares. And if she's ironed out 20 lengths, they'll probably retire her. Uh, there's too many unknowns for me in terms of nine to four pokes. 
uh, to be getting involved. Yes, there's an argument she could line up a lot shorter, but I'm not sure she'd line up that much shorter because for her to line up in the mayors, I think she's going to have to be totally unconvincing at the Dublin Racing Festival, mm. if that makes sense. So all in all, I would be swerving her from a betting perspective in any market. Um, uh, I mean, she's a fantastic mayor. I think we've gone a little bit OTT on the pessimism drive. It wasn't all that kind of bad a run on a seasonal reappearance on pretty deep ground. She faced two horses. And one was rated, what, 164 and one rated in the high 150s. And um, look, she didn't get the job done. What was what was worrying, I think, was the fact she looked like she got the job done and then seemed to cut out. Now, whether that's just she doesn't want to quite go through with it, you know, she is getting older, as we said on the, the jump show, uh, the preview show uh, a couple of months ago. You know, at some point, she is going to regress. That is just a fact. Um, and it could be she is just now just on the wane. So all in all, I think there's too many unknowns about her. She's a smashing mare. Uh, I'd love to see her come roaring back. I'd love to see her absolutely trounce the field, funny enough, in mm. the Irish champion, because then that does at least set up the match we all want to see, even if we in in uh, pretty much an agreement here, Constitution Hill will come up on top. It'd be great to see, as a sport, Honeysuckle kind of go out on a shield in a final run in the champion hurdle, having arrived there on the back of a, a five length success at the Dublin Racing Festival or something. So uh, all in all, n- uh, there's not a single market by which I am attracted to Honeysuckle from a, a betting proposition. Uh, Andy, thoughts on the mares? Well, given what we've seen so far this season, um, the best form line seems to be the bond that um, Brandy Love um uh, won last year when she won at Ferry as the grade one beating Love Envoy. She stuffed her by eight lengths and she did it almost jumping off the track on the last two hurdles. Yeah. Uh, I had to go back and revisit that race just to see how much ground she did give away. Um, so you'd suggest going left handed um, this season, I presume. Um, she's going to be even stronger force. I think she won at Nice last year as well, which is obviously about a left handed track. So uh, she could be even better going that way around. She's yet to uh, go to Cheltenham, which is the only negative I could see. It's not a good negative yet, as such, because he's obviously it's in, it's not proven, proven either hill there whether she does um, uh, like uh, Presbury Park. But I, I think she's probably got the strongest form line um, of anything we've seen. You know, we've talked heads have talked about only Silk and Savoy, and perhaps you know not quite um, the force that she might be, and an epitome, you know. Do like the mayor. She's very admirable, but um, you know she, whether she can cope with an up-and-coming young rival like Brandy Love, who's still got plenty of uh, mileage left in her legs. Then um, I wouldn't wouldn't be absolutely sure about. So I think the standout prize for me would be Brandy Love, given what um, Love Envoy did to her field the other day at Sandown. Brandy Love six to one best price. Uh, that is with Skybet. Uh, on then to Wednesday, starting with the Champion Chase. And uh, a heavyweight clash at the top of the market between two Cheltenham Festival winners uh, earlier this year. And Ergamine uh, is even money after that wide margin of victory over the weekend. Edward Stone, similarly impressive uh, on his reappearance, is 11 to 4, uh, 16 to 1 bar those, uh, with Shishkin 16 to 1, Grenatine 20 to 1, Blue Lord 25s, New Belegra 25s, 33 to 1 bar. Um, at the moment, Andy, it looks a little bit like a match. Um, you know, we'll talk about Shishkin in a second. Um, but do you think. Off what we've seen from these two over the past 18 months and then over the past couple of weeks, do you think the market's got this about right? Yeah, I think this is likely to go down the route of where most champion chases do in the last sort of decade or even further back. Oh, yeah, you get the reigning champion setting a good standard and he ends up having to take on the Arca winner. Um, and I think we had a good Arca winner in, in, in the shape of Edward Stone last season. Um, and he's already proven himself against the older horses this year and I thought he was devastating the Tingle Creek I must admit I wasn't really expecting that I think me and Ed were relatively lukewarm about him in comparison to perhaps Grenatine on the day on the ground you know as it turned out it's probably a little bit softer or deader in places that connections of Grenatine would have liked but either way I think he probably ran close to something like his best anyway obviously Shiskin flopped he, he, he was nowhere near the horse that we've seen um, in that in the last season or two but that was kind of like on the cards with him a little bit like I said I thought the alarm bells were very much there for me at the festival last season albeit the ground was obviously used as an excuse you just don't like to say a horse sort of not even put in any effort up until halfway that day like he did so there's obviously something a little bit mental as long as well as physical with him um, 
So at this stage of the game, it does very much like it is between the two. And of the two, I must admit, I think Edward Stone's performance in winning that Tingle Creek has to be better than obviously Nergamin's victory today. I mean, only yesterday, of course, fresh off the paint, but I mean, he was one to nine. I mean, we didn't really learn anything that we didn't already know about him. He beat a horse of Henry de Bromeds who'd won a handicap the year before. Master Max Shea, his main market rival, in inverted commas, broke a blood vessel. And I mean, I've already done the numbers as well. And albeit he, he didn't really, wasn't fully extended, you, could, you couldn't really say, oh, that's as good as he is. But, you know, the, the novice chase was quicker than him. Um, one by Impervious, who we'll get onto a little bit later on on the card, on the on this on this podcast. So, you know, Edward Stone's run a faster number already this season, albeit in a small sample size, and we know he loves Chelsea. So it's it's a it's it's a I think it's a question of which is the which is the value, and I think the eleven to four standout at the moment with Corals about Edward Stone has has got to be the uh, the option I think for me. Ed, do you agree? Yeah. You yeah, have no strong view on this race, to be honest with you. Again, it's another one which is, uh, I've got this marked, it. I'll, I'll buy or sell it five and a half runners type thing. This is going to cut up drastically. It's going to be a big clash we want to see. Uh, I've got no problem with small fields as long as they're, they're chock full of quality. And Nergamine versus Edward Stone. Yeah, possibly I would be with Edward Stone. I mean, there is an argument his Tingle Creek <coughs> performance uh, is better than a Nergamine's champion chase performance. When you actually look at the, the raw form and the way he did it, uh, beating Funnable, Civilla, uh, et cetera, and Shishkin obviously bombed out. And um, I don't know. It's not a race that particularly got me inspired. I was looking for the the without market again here, George, trying to snake under the radar because mm. in a race which I do think will literally be five runners, I was looking for Nube Negra each way without. He's going straight to the champion chase. Uh, he's 25 to one win only. I don't think that can that will work. And plus, if the rains came, he'd be a non-runner. But he will be one of five runners. And if the ground, if we've got the uh, cost of the Dow Gloucester, we've got 10 days of dry weather, uh, I don't think he'd be a forlorn hope to at least give the, the big two something to think about. You know, he's beaten a length in the champion chase a couple of years ago. Um, he came back on the Schlur chase, one doing handstands, obviously, in a, in a, in a nothing event. But uh, he would be, if someone did go uh, on in the without uh, market or even without the big two, uh, look for something like that, but all in all, um, it would be a race three months in advance. That if you haven't got involved in yet, oh, I, c- I couldn't back an eleven to four shot three months in advance. Definitely couldn't back an even money shot. And outside of that, I'm not inspired by it by anything personally. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, in Doug Bannantine terms. I'm out. Well, when I next come back to you, we've got the first, uh, you know, rubber stamped selection coming up soon. But before we do move on to uh, the racing on Thursday and, and specifically the Ryanair. And I just want to ask you about Shishkin because, um, you know, we've seen Shishkin now at the Cheltenham Festival, uh, you know, be pulled up on account of the ground, uh, but then in the Tingle Creek, another really flat performance where he didn't really seem to be uh, going a yard pretty much from from, from when they jumped. Um, Nicky Henderson has come out immediately afterwards and said, you know, the plan will, will be to send Shishkin over further. Uh, does that look like the solution to you? Or is this just maybe a case of a a once great horse who's somewhat lost his way. Yeah, and it's hard to tell whether that ends up being the, the solution. Um, he's obviously hasn't got the pace, which which seems odd, really, given that you know how dominant he, he looked in his division as a as a as a novice over two miles to all of a sudden look extremely one paced over the same distance against. Um, you know, his, his, his peers, as, as we've seen in the last two runs. I mean, he, he just looked in trouble from a long way out from Ed Sandown, what Ed thought, but there couldn't have been that many excuses. I mean, Nicky would have got him rock hard fit. You know, that's he can't afford to mess around with grade ones. You've got to get him absolutely, you know, bang on the money. Sandown, you know, should have suited him, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, it was, you, couldn't, you couldn't use the ground as an excuse because, you know, they were blaming, obviously, every ground at Charm. You can't have it both ways. Um, but I mean that mistake as well at the pond fence that was uncharacteristic of him. He's normally a very good jumper. It's just not something that lurking at the back of my mind with him. I, I don't like I said. I don't think it's a, not necessarily sure it's a trip thing. Um, I, I'd want more evidence of Shiskin visually rather than sort of like you know guessing where he's going to he's gonna, what, what's going to help him trip wise or whatever. Than than before I started thinking about getting involved with him. He's just one of those ones that. I know you should never ride a horse just after one run, but that's two now. 
and, and that's becoming a little bit of a problem. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be very much um, against your skin at the moment. You know, that uh, incredible heavyweight clash with Nergimi back at Ascot seems to have taken its toll. Uh, yeah. If there is if there is a, a man who can bring a horse back to former glories, it is, of course, Nicky Henderson. Uh, we've seen it before and, and maybe we'll see it again. Uh, on then to the Ryanair, and as I say, this is the first race where we've got uh, one of the guys uh, have put up one of their selections. Um, we've got three selections from Ed and, and four from Andy over the course of the podcast. Uh, I'll run through the market quickly. Uh, Alaho is the 15 to 8 favourite. So dominant, of course, uh, in this race, but some fitness concerns uh, at this stage. Uh, Gallup and shot, uh, 7 to 1. Uh, you think unlikely to, to be targeting this with the Gold Cup in mind. Shishkin, we just mentioned there, is 8 to 1. Uh, if uh, he is to step up and trip, Brave Man's Game, 11 to 1. Fakir Duderi, 14 to 1. Envoy Allen, uh, 16 to 1. Chacun Pour 16 to 1. Edward Stone, who we just mentioned there, unlikely, you'd think, to be targeting this, uh, 16 to 1. But Anergamine, similar story, 20 to 1. And that brings us on to Blue Lord, 20 to 1. And Ed, the way I can see your brain has been working over the last uh, 48 hours preparing for this, I think this could cut up a fair bit, couldn't it? Yeah. I think he's the 20 to 1 favourite. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm being serious. In in your intro there, George, you put unlikely, maybe, and if twice next yeah. to uh, six horses ahead of him. Alaho's on the sidelines, Gallop and Deschamps, they're going to try everything they can to make him a gold cup pool. Shishkin could be retired. Uh, who knows if we can end up here. Brave man's game, um, I'd say very unlikely to come here. Could it. I mean, Envoy Allen, I mean, if he runs well in the King George, they said they're going to look at the Gold Cup. Shaka Boussard, then runs well, et cetera, et cetera. Edward Stone, Champion Chase Race. Don't think they're going to run. And if Alaho doesn't turn up, again, the vibes, Richard Thompson for Cheveley Park was interviewed, wasn't he, on uh, Sky mm-hmm. Race a couple of days ago. Again, uh, just re- insinuations, but I'm sure there's, he's not quite as well as we were led to believe. You know, Willie Mullins uh, six weeks or so ago or a month ago, it was a, oh, it's a minor setback. We'll give him a prep run in the new year and then Cheltenham. Well, uh, Mitchell Thompson was saying, like, well, it's 50 50. If we can get a run into him, you might have to go straight there. You never know. Things don't quite. It was all a very glass half empty kind of, you know. Uh, interview essentially and you're talking about a six to four poke for the festival so i think this market is just rife for things to come through blue lord to me it's just jumping off the page i think he's an absurd price at 22 i generally mm. think he's the favorite for this race i actually think he is he won the clon maul chase on his comeback and it was fascinating listening to paul townend's thoughts after they said look they weren't sure whether we would get this trip they rode him to get the trip they were absolutely mortified um, but I believe the ground um, had been OK at, at Clonmel um, in the build up to it. Absolutely lashed it down the night before. It went heavy. So it was uh, his first time at two and a half on really deep ground. He came off the bridle after being pretty keen for the first mile and yet found plenty uh, to power, power home in the closing stages. Beating last year's King George winner, Tornado Fly. If anything come out, stayed the stayer in very mm. deep ground. I thought it was a fantastic performance. I was shocked. To see him, like, there wasn't really much of a market reaction afterwards. And um, Willie Mullins, again, you could you have to take some things. Willie Mullins does say with a pinch of salt, but he did say, well, look, we've proven he stays the intermediate trip now. We've got an ergamine in the two-mile division. We've got Gallup in the Champ, we're well-stopped in other divisions. He looks the natural horse to come through to the two-and-a-half-mile rank. Well, now, if you dovetail that with the fact if Alaho is crocked and on the sidelines, it isn't going to make it. Uh, Blue Lord suddenly becomes the the primary Willie Mullins two and a half mile horse, and I I, I just think he's an absolutely huge price. He may lack a, a touch of class that a few of the other winners of this have in the past, but he's still relatively lightly raced. So the form of that Clonmel run is is mustard, and he's performed well at the festival before, wasn't he? I mean, he would have been second in the Supreme to appreciate it when he went at the last, uh, and he ran well in the Arco as well. All in all, uh, twenty to one. I know this is a million miles away. You could play this back when I've got an egg on my face, but I wouldn't be shocked if he was your, your seven to two favourite in, in three months' time because, again, process of elimination, as you said, uh, I think there's 10 horses ahead of him who are, I'm just as likely to run in the Ryanair as they are, to be honest with you. So, yeah, Blue Lord, 20 to one for me. I think it's a huge price. Also travelled incredibly well in the Arca as well, if I remember correctly, um, before kind of not maybe just not quite having the, the class to go with Edwardstone. And then, but, but this, this is a good point you make there, George, because I thought I thought was it was it class was he outpaced? Did he not get up the hill? Uh, that jury is still out a little bit, but he does move through races like a class horse. And what I'm so encouraged was on his return, his first run of the season, 
deep ground in a good race, despite being really keen. He, he did everything he could to be beaten in on his seasonal reappearance. And he could have, there have been loads of excuses. If he'd fallen in a hole, you would have said, well, look, there's a list here as long as my arm of why he's fallen in a hole. Yet he came off the bridle and he powered home. I just think two and a half miles might just unlock him. Uh, mm. That could be the key to him. And as I say, this could end up being the, as it often is in many respects, it's the substandard of the two, isn't it? We could have mega clashes in the Gold Cup trip. We could have three or four runners in the champion chase, but very good ones. Here, this just looks really airy fairy, to be honest with you. But Blue Lord, I can't, I can't see him going the Gold Cup trip. I cannot see why they bring him back to the Champion Chase trip to take on Edward Stone uh, and Anergamine. Here, as I said to you, I think he's, he's the 20 to 1 favourite. That, that's my view on it. Uh, I'd be shocked if it comes to March and he's got four legs if he's not favourite or second favourite for this contest. I guess, I mean, the, the issue is that it's often the afterthought race, isn't it? It's often the, the race that where yeah. if, a, if a Gold Cup horse doesn't quite, but th- those horses have a terrible record in the race. It's rare that you get a Gold Cup horse who, you know, who, who flounders in preparation for the Gold Cup, comes back to the Ryanair and goes and, and puts it up them. So, uh, and in Blue Lord, you've got, you know, you mentioned a possible class issue, but that seven and a half length defeat by Edward Stone's aged okay. And yeah. after that, went and reversed the form of Gabby Nacco in second as well. So, um, you know, the, the form stacks up pretty well. Uh, Andy, anything to add on the Ryanair? No, I think, um, I mean, Ed obviously sent these over. We got a little WhatsApp chat room the other day. And um, when he sent that one over straight away, I thought, yeah, that's a really good pick. Um, with all the, you know, the the reasons he's already outlined, it's the kind of thing that I normally look for, you know, when you can cross off one after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, so I can't really add a lot to what Ed's already said about Blue no Lord. Give it the massive thumbs up. The form of that um, Clonmel Oil race has already worked out well as well. I don't think it actually mentioned that, but perhaps he, he, he forgot about it in passing. But the Rasso, the, the, the third horse, who's a very reliable um, Joseph O'Brien stroke, J.P. McManus' own horse, who went to win next time out at Thurless, has already given that form a boost. So it's pretty strong form. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Blue Lord. I've always thought he's been a bit underestimated. He, he probably would have finished second in the Supreme had he not fallen at the last. And obviously there's nothing wrong with his run beyond Edward Stone. Um, so yeah, if you know that that I can't like I say I can't disagree. The only other one that I thought probably is a smidgen of value, given the same reasons that Ed's already outlined. If we've got doubts about one or two others, and I think a lot of those doubts actually influence this other horse I'm going to mention here, and that's Faco Duduris, because he missed the Ryanair last season and got saved specifically for Aintree to win the. Um, the two and a half mile of there. I think is it the Melling Chase, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if the likes of, you know, your your Alahose are floating around again this year, connections will probably look at it and think, well, you know, we've taken Al Alaba before, we've got our we've got our um backside smack spanked. So it's no point, you know, making the same mistakes again and we'll just go to Aintree when Alaho will be safer at um home soil and and we'll attack the two and a half mile that he he loves around that flat track. Um, but with Alaho out the way, maybe, as Ed's intimated, and a few others, they might just regroup and think, well, we'll, we'll have a rub- we'll have a roll of the dice at this. And we know how good he's on the on his day over two and a half miles, when in inverted commas one or two of the big guns are are, are not there. Um, they tried three miles a couple of times because it was an extra option. I thought, well, where do we go? Let, let's let's roll the dice, and it obviously didn't come to fruition at um, Punchestown beyond Alaho. So I think they know they've got an absolute out and out two and a half mile horse. They're not going to mess around this year by running him over three. So there's not that many races they can run him in, is there really? I mean, he'll have perhaps one run, even over shorter at home, soil or over two and a half, they can find it. And then it's either Cheltenham or, or Aintree. But I think he'll go into this part of the season a lot fresher than he has done. So th- there's, there's options for him. And he's 14 to one. I mean, he's, He's never a fourteen to one shot for the Ryanair if if you know he things go his way. So I'll just throw another horse into the into the equation just for um just for the hell of it really. Oh, a bit of value, yeah. that's why. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. I think well I think we, basically what we've outlined here is Ed's at, pick the primary primary one at, at twenty to one. That's never he can never be a twenty to one shot blue law. That's complete oversight by bookmakers there. And punters aren't looking, but obviously Ed's Pointed you in the right direction there, and Fakir Duduris is the other, you know, preeminent two and a half mile horse who's proven at Grade One level for the last two seasons, and you can get fourteen to one the one, and 
arguably 20 to 1 about one of his understudies. It's just, the yeah, madness, the pair of them. <laughs> yeah, that 20 to 1 is with Labbrook's, Labbrook's uh, 16 to 1. It's kind of market price uh, for Blue Lord. And then 14 to 1, Fakir Dairy, 888, Bet Victor Coral, and a couple of others. Uh, on then to uh, the stay is hurdle uh, with Florian <laughs> Porter. <laughs> what what's the what's the the laugh? Oh, this yeah, this division is is enough to send your send your <laughs> your eye spammer. It's just a, a nightmare division. This that's that's the, definitely the easiest laugh I've ever got in my life. So that's good. Uh, just had to say the stairs. Uh, for important to the five to one favourite, um, going for a, a treble in the race. Blazing Carl, um, we haven't seen for a while, have we? Uh, seven to one, uh, Blazing Blazing Carl, uh, second favourite. Classical Dream, eight to one. Uh, State man twelve to one, Tiapu twelve to one, Buzz Andy, um, you know, heartbreak for love for you last year, uh, fourteen mm-hmm. to one, Bob Ollinger sixteen to one. Um, you know this is a a race, Andy, that you thought you kind of had a grip of last year before Buzz's injury, uh, but I'm guessing by your reaction you, you don't feel like that this time around. Yeah, the vibes aren't particularly strong either for Buzz. You would have liked to have thought that maybe Nicky would have had him in a position where they could have maybe had a look at the long walk again. They've obviously got the cleave hurdle as, as another possible, but once they're running out of time, but you'd like, you'd like to think they get at least one run into him between now and the festival, or be Nicky's won the Cesar, which have a long break with him. But yeah, the, the vibes aren't, aren't great. What you're reading about the reports about buzz, um, which is a little bit of a shame, but yeah, I mean, it's five to one the field. I mean, Ed's talked about races and categories being wide open. I think this one, division has been a complete mess for the last two or three years and that and that's not decrying anything away from Florian Porter but I do think Florian Porter's took advantage of a particularly substandard three mile category for a long time now and he's basically just had to do what he did the year before to, to repeat the dose because I don't think we had anything coming in from left field any 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 um Johnny come lately he's upsetting the party you know we've had the classical dreams of this world Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, uh, as his only viable opponents, um, the the Irish scene seems fairly um, dry on 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 three mile stairs. Obviously, we've got Champ and Paisley Park over here, but they're going to be eleven years old. The pair of them next year. I mean, you've got to go back to was it Crimson Embers back in the in the eighties? I think for the last double figure win. I think in fact, I think that horse was the only double figure age winner. Uh, of these days in, in its um, in its history, so the record books are not exactly um, in the favour of those either. So I actually did a piece on this race for for odds checker oh, about a month ago because they were basically just asking me to pick a race randomly and and, and write up about it. And I came to the conclusion that there could be a if there is a left field horse, it could be home from the Lee who beat Florian Porter. Relatively fair and square on the day, I thought, um, in, in the Boyne Hurdle the other day. Um, and let's not forget, he ran really well when he was inexperienced in last year's stage. He didn't get beat that far. And, and to my eyes, he seems to have improved. I thought he was a big price. Um, you mentioned Charles Burns, and he's obviously got Blazing Cal. But I do think if there's going to be a, a horse coming through from the ranks of the handicappers, like Florian Porter did, that's not forget, Florian Porter was a handicapper before he won the, the stairs. I thought Run for Oscar was definitely one to consider. Winning the Cesar Rich and an easy win of the Cesar Rich at that when the ground was in his favour. And I thought he ran really well under a big weight the other day. And I know it was a handicap, but it was a cracking good handicap. That was at Haydock. You know, all the all the best sort of sort of dangerous floaters in that division were in that race. Um, I think that form's strong. He's he's another uh, interesting contender at a price. And I'm going to mention one to Ed as well. And I don't know if he th- thinks the same as me here, but the devil in me thinks that a hoy senor if he ever was to come back mm. and go back over her and I'd, unfortunately I don't think he's with the right people and I mean that in the nicest respect for them to even think outside the box and drop him back over hurdles and exploit what is a weak division because they are very much a chasing background mm. set up on they Lucinda Russell and, and Pascu you know that they, they, they obviously think this horse is that you know they're, they're it's a complete apple of their eye, and they they they've got him obviously as a chaser now, and and they want to try and you know press on and, and get him to the horse they think he might be, i.e. a gold cup horse. But he's jumping has left a lot to be desired in his last two stroke three runs, and he almost looks a liability now over fences. If he, if he were mine, I'd say look, 
let's let's put that on the back burner while we've got Gallop and Deschamps and we've got a few of the big names like Protectorat and a Plutard still floating around in the Gold Cup category. Let's just attack the stayers because don't forget look what he did to his opposition, i.e. Brave Man's game in in, the, in that three mile hurdle at Aintree not so long ago. So he's got a massive engine, and if he was to run in the stairs for me, I think he'd nearly win it. Because the flat speeds there, it's just jumping offensive, which is the problem. And yeah, he's like 33 to one. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of like conjuring up a few names like Ed does, you know, with a with a view to thinking there, there could be a few possibilities out here, um, looking outside the uh, the ones on the front end. Yeah, hoist your 33 to one best price. That's with Unibet and, and Bet365. Um, and of the others that you mentioned, uh, we had um, Home by the Lees. So Home by the Lee is 25 to one. Um, and also, who was your uh, your pick at the? Uh, yeah, uh, run for Oscar. Those are the three names. Run I went for Oscar. For. 30, yeah. 30, 33 to one across the board. Uh, run a for lot Oscar. can happen between now and then. There's going to be other prep races. There's the clay hurdle. There's the Garmore hurdle over in mm. Ireland. There's other handicap. There's a there's a lot can happen in this division. You know, Floor Imports will probably you know go to uh, Leopardstown again at Christmas and maybe win that race. Um, but he'll probably only beat the likes of Sir de Burley and all that kind of fodder. So. Yeah, it's it's just in a blazing cow's out could be out for the year. Like I said, there's a lot go, there's a lot going on in this market at the moment. It's very much a subject of flux and um but that hoisting your pro like I say, if, if I ever had a conversation with Linda Lucinda Russell at um uh, at the races uh, uh, I'd I would definitely say to I think you ought to have a look or at least make an entry for the stay as early because mm. it, it'd be um it'd be a missed opportunity otherwise. Yeah, it's some interesting angles there from Andy. Uh, Ed, any any uh, you know thoughts from you on, in terms of, of big price value in the stayers? Yeah, this is uh, today's episode of Equine Roulette, isn't it? Uh, we <laughs> said it at the top and showed a few wide open markets. This is it. This is um, it's absolutely bonkers stuff. You start going through it, you can pick them all apart. I mean, Florian Porter needed the ride and everything on his comeback, but it was quite underwhelming um i don't know this is a real head scratcher i totally see where andy's coming from with a hoist in your i mean it sounds like he's going to the roland merrick at weatherby on boxing day isn't he off top weight next time out i suppose if he did jump like a snooker table um they they may then at least start to think about reverting back to the small obstacles but so he goes and puts in a bold show in that then it almost by default uh, means they continue on the on the chasing path. I, I get. I think this is a really funny old market. I actually think Gordon Elliott's got a quite a say a strong hand would be the wrong word, but he's definitely got a, a stronger hand than others in this. Shall we say? I mean, Tahupu, I uh, got the job done in good style in, in flooring uh, in honeysuckle. It sounds like they're going to go the three mile route rather than the two mile route. The big asterisk next to him is though all his best form has come on soft, very deep ground and. Gordon Elliott has said that, but he's also got a couple of other horses in his stable, same ownership, same connections. Uh, he's got Z- uh, Zana here and Queensbrook. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if one of those really throws themselves into the picture. Now, Zana here was, was awful on his comeback in that run with Florian Porter and, and Bob Ollinger and Home by the Lee, etc. Uh, made a big noise after, by all accounts, has gone for a wind operation since. So at least there seems to be some a form of ready-made excuse. He's running in the three-mile Grade one over Christmas time, taking on floor import. And now, if you can forgive that run last time out, I think he's a an unexposed sort who should really thrive going up in trip. He ran really well when placed in the champion hurdle last year. He was in the process of running a really good race up to two and a half miles for the first time at Aintree when he crashed out at the last flight. He was kind of staying on at the time. I think three miles will be the making of him. So I wouldn't give him up, up on him yet. Queensbrook is the interesting one because the, the the raw form of what she's achieved is is way below what's needed. But uh, Gordon Elliott seems adamant she's a three miler. She's actually got an entry. She's been left in the five days for the long walk hurdle uh, at Ascot. If it does go ahead this Saturday, uh, be fascinating to see her with her mare's allowance tested over three miles for the first time in a in a division which Andy says there's a lot of old legs running around here. At some point, your Paisley Parks and your Champs of this world they can't just keep going on and running these good races forever. Uh, and some of these this younger blood's got to, at some point, come forward uh, and kind of take the mantle a little bit. So it's a race I'm fairly lukewarm on, but I, I have backed both of those horses for the stairs hurdle, just for small bets. Uh, Zana here with the wind up. I wouldn't be shocked if he, he ruffled the feathers of Florian Porter over Christmas. Uh, Queensbrook's interesting. Well, I think she's about 33 to 1. Mm. Uh, with her mayor's allowance, 
taking on some of those older legs, again, I, I, I think there could be improvement there. And I, I mean, I thought it looked natural that the two and a half mile route might be where Queensbrook goes. Of course, you ran a stormer uh, when runner up in the uh, Tamarese Rock in the Mayor's Hurdle itself last year. But for whatever reason, um, she seems to be telling Gordon Elliott uh, three miles is the way to go. So they're at least going to test the water with her. So say if she the, the meeting at Ascot does go ahead. She's in receipt of half a stone from from Paisley Park and Champ. I wouldn't be shocked if she gave them a race there. And then that's mapped out the rest of her season, hasn't it? So uh, all in all, as Andy says, this is an absolute um, migraine, migraine job. Should, should be an advert for some form of headache tablet or something. Because uh, <laughs> this really is it, it's exciting uh, if from a better perspective because it is incredibly wide open. You know, Long gone are the years that the big bucks or the Ingalls Streve are soaking up. 60% mm. of the market uh, as we head into the new year. This is uh, this is fascinating stuff. Sandy here, 25 to 1 with Hills, 365 in Unibet, 33 to 1 across the board there for Queensbrook. There, Ed's two against the field. Plenty uh, of food for thought there in the stayers uh, hurdle. Second bet up now, and it is the big race, uh, arguably, well, big race of the week, I, I guess, uh, in some people's eyes at least. Uh, Gallop and Deschamps is the 11 to 4 favourite in the Gold Cup uh, ahead of Long Press at 7 to 1. Uh, Apple Tard, 10 to 1. Uh, Noble Yates, after that mightily impressive victory last time out, um, is 12 to 1. Protector at also 12 to 1. Uh, and that is Andy Holdings' first uh, selection. Uh, Andy, what, what about Protector at makes you think that 12 to 1 is a value at this stage? Yeah, I, I, I just think it's a bit of an insult, really. It's a, it's a bit of a bonkers price. It was almost as if bookmakers just didn't give him the credit he deserved for winning that Betfair chase, concentrating more on a Plutard's demise. Um, but there's, there's often a reason why horses like Plutard will um, run badly. Um, and people sometimes draw to the wrong conclusions. I think the conclusion is drawn to a Plutard were that, you know, the ground was probably a bit quick for him and what have you. And, you know, fitness-wise, there was, there was a little issue or he might have had a little niggle that they didn't they weren't aware about. But basically, he was running in a very strongly run race. Uh, and under those conditions on the day, he, he just, he just, he just couldn't, he just couldn't cope. Um, and when you go back and you do the time figure like, like we have, you can see the reason why a horse like him would not run up to his best. Um, because it almost came a little bit unexpected. He was like, what the hell, what the hell is this? It was just like a, well, not, it wasn't a culture shock because obviously he's running, you know, strongly run races before, but, Perhaps they under, I think almost looked as if the De Bromhead team had underestimated um, the opposition and what, what it probably took to, to win that race that day because Protector Rat was absolutely right on the money all the way through the race. He jumped, he travelled, and the figure that he did was just sensational. We get time figures of that ill perhaps once every two or three years. Um Almost like you know, proper like high level Gold Cup standard, like a your album photos and a Plutards at their absolute maximum best, uh, and that's exactly what Protector did. Um, you know, his overall figure was up there with like Alaho's figure when he won the Ryanair for the first year. So I think, and I'm, I'm urging people to take that race, the Betfair Chase victory, a little bit more seriously, perhaps that what they have done originally, and I think. Now with Protector at they they know what they've got, um, and they're going to campaign him specifically now with the Gold Cup again in mind, which they obviously they did to a degree last year. They're just going to go straight to the Cotswold Chase. They're going to avoid going to the King George, which I think is a wise move, and then it'll just be all roads lead to Charlemagne. Let's not forget, you know, he he was very respectable third last year uh, on his first attempt in 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 that real deep comedy, but. Reading the comments as well, he seems to have improved physically, mentally. He's a stronger horse, and and that and that was borne out in that performance at Haydock. It wasn't a left field performance. It wasn't like, oh my goodness, where's that come from? He's always been capable of something brilliant, but that was to an extra level, uh, because the figures told you that was the case. And at twelve to one, I mean that that's he shouldn't have, he shouldn't be anywhere near twelve to one. Um, I'd fancy him to beat a Plutard again. Um, and yeah, he's he's probably one of my strongest anti-post views that I've got, really, to be honest. That 12 to 1 is with Ladbrokes, 10 to 1 and plenty of others there as well. Andy's first tip of the show um, there in the Gold Cup. Um, Ed, I'm sure you've got a view as well. Uh, 
where do you see this Gold Cup market as it stands? Mm, yeah, fascinating again, isn't it? Um, I mean, the official line coming out of the De Bromhead camp yesterday was the, you know, the the bloods have come back. The blood blood sample was sent off to a lab and has come back and has uh, shown the horse had an allergic reaction for what it's worth. And that that was the, I don't know whether that's the, the backfitted story, if you like, but that is the <laughs> official line. The horse had an allergic reaction uh, in, before in the Betfair chase and, and that's that. So make it out what you will. But uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's a funny old race. It's one of those I'm starting to... I go through each horse, so I think you can make a good case for that. You can make a good case for that. And uh, I, I've got no problem with Protector at all fitting into that category. I think Lob Press is really solid. I was astounded by his comeback run. I think I mentioned it on the show a couple of weeks ago. On decent ground, first time out when the you know connections were said he'd need the run off 164. I think that was a, a monstrous performance. Uh, I think someone put up a stat, wasn't it, in the, in the top eight weight carrying performances this century or something. I think, I think it was a brilliant run. No problem with long press at all. Of course, he's got the been there and done it factor at Cheltenham and start going through them all. And uh, yeah, making cases for bits and pieces of them. So look, we'll put anyone off protector at. I mean, again, it seems in every market we're talking about galloping the shot and we're yet to see him. Well, uh, as we're recording this, the news is coming through that the, the John Durkin's being rearranged to uh, Monday, the 19th of December. And it sounds like Gallopin' Shop will run in that. So at least we'll get to see this horse back and see he's got four legs and everything. And whether they go from there onto that Mickey Mouse race <laughs> Tremor or what they look to look to afterwards, we don't know. But uh, all in all, um, yeah, I, I, I'll let Andy take the floor on this one, really. I, I'm, I'm often looking for an absolute, you know, left field bonkers one in here, uh, uh, George. And I, I do think there might be one uh, absolute mad one in here. Because I actually think this horse has got a cracking chance to win the King George. And by that logic, if he does, his prize will tumble. And that is Hitman. Mm. Uh, he's, he's 66 to 1. Um, he's currently second favourite, joint second favourite to win at Kempton. He's going up to three miles for the first time. Just put it out there. Obviously, if he does go and beat his stable mate Brave Man's game and et al. Uh, and wins the King George, and suddenly... Um, well, Nichols has got some uh, interesting thoughts on his mind then. It, it, it probably confirms that Brave Man's game won't go anywhere near Cheltenham and they'll save him for entry. And uh, it might suddenly thrust Hitman into a serious uh, Gold Cup contender. And they seem to have quite sporting connections, you know, with Sir Alex Ferguson on board. And he's 66 to 1. He wins to King George. He's single figures. Um, that, that's the kind of angle I'm coming in through there. So I, I don't think he's the the daftest one in the world. And actually, he's got a serious chance at Kempton. I've been saying for ages on this show, mm. three miles is where what he needs. I think he will flourish. The form of his um, old Rome comeback is working out uh, unbelievable, wasn't he? He was given the best part of two stone to Gar Law. That's come out and won the... Uh, come out won the Paddy Power Gold Cup since the, the form of that race you go through it just looks uh, solid really solid and um, so yeah I, I wouldn't put anyone off protector up I, I think you can make a case for half a dozen in here but um, Hitman is the the silly season one George if I'm, I'm on him <laughs> for good money for the King George and I, I really think I think there's an argument to say he should be the stable first string personally I know it sounds a little bit crackers on the on the face of it but I, I really don't think there's much between uh, Brave Man's game and Hitman as, as perhaps connections are letting on. I suppose we'll see in, in two weeks' time. But um, Hitman for me, 66s, I think it's a cheap way to do your money. Um, it could be, <laughs> it, it could look really good if in a fortnight's time he does the business at summary venue because he will, by default, for winning a King George, be 8-1 to one tops to, to win this. I feel like I've seen this one before. A Paul Nichols horse wins the Gold Cup, but wins the uh, the King George and gets sent to the Gold Cup. Uh, it doesn't normally end too well, but hopefully this time with Hitman, it could have a have, have a different ending. Uh, but it, it, even it. if it doesn't, George, the point is you you, you couldn't you're, you're, in position, you're in a position then to do all sorts, aren't you? Even if the horse bolts up and then Nichols says, "Oh, well, we won't go near Cheltenham in a month of Sundays." Well, you you know you can you can hedge, you can do what you want. I, yeah. I just have, I'm I'm going through those of twenty five to one down, mm. and again I'll just go through them, go through the, the horses in there. That might as well be a thousand to one to, to yeah. win the Gold yeah, Cup. Yeah. You know, he's he's the same price as Mount Ida, Miller's Bank, and Happy Go Lucky to win a to win a Gold Cup. You know, uh, Vanillier is a shorter price. It's just nonsense. Um, basically, whereas he, he is a genuine class horse, second favourite to win a, a King George amongst a load of dead wood. So um, I'm hoping for a really big ride at, at Kempton and then we could, um, I could start getting excited. Right. We have, um, yeah, we have to get through quite a lot now in quite a short space of time. Um, but Hitman there, the one for, for Ed at a massive price, as he says, uh, 66 to 1 with Bet365, uh, Unibet and Skybet. 
And we're now going to go back to Tuesday again, or back to the beginning, and we're going to do the novice hurdles. Um, so we've got uh, we've got a bet coming up in the Ballymore and a bet coming up in the two bets, I should say, in the Albert Bartlett with the Supreme. Um, you know, Andy, you are the, the man we come to for these novice hurdles because of your your, your time figures. And Fasal Vega is the five to four favourite for the Supreme, with Jet Power seven to one, um, Marine National ten to one, Irish Point eighteen to one, Gaelic Warrior twenty to one, uh, twenty five to one. Bar those very quickly because we have to spend more time on the other two. Um, how do you see the Supreme market as it stands now? Yeah, I mean, I've, look, you know, I've, I've been a fan of Fasal Vega for the thick end of twelve months now when he burst onto the scene at the at the Christmas meeting and clocked that big time and hopefully one or two of the listeners have followed him accordingly down the road. Um, you know, like like everyone else, I was looking forward to his debut the other day and look, he, he jumped and he travelled and he looked at the horse we thought he was over hurdles. But, you know, being a time man, I've, I've got to take an objective view on what he did on the figures and it was, it was just a very, very slowly run, nothing race. I mean, he was eight to one on and he didn't beat, to, beat anything and he ran to a time figure of 48, which is one of the slowest novice hurdles basically we've had all season. Um, incidentally, and, and coincidentally, the second favourite, um, yeah, Howard, ran an even slower time when he won at Newbury. It was a joke of a race. I mean, he ran to a 42 time figure that we've got. I mean, the, the standard for a, a preeminent supreme novice hurdle winner would be somewhere around the 75 mark. We've only got a couple of horses so far this season in the novice category running anywhere near that, and that's Marine National, who, who won the Royal Bond. You'd expect a Grade One race to be somewhere close to that, which which he did. And, and the other one is Lucia, who, who clocked a seventy when she won her novice hurdle at um, at Newbury. I mean, you, you're talking about genuine good time figures there, but from quality horses. I'm, I'm not saying that you know that that's the rating that Fasal Vega's ever going to achieve. Of course, it's not. It's nonsense. He's in a better race. He's going to run quicker, but I'm just giving you the facts of what he did, and yet he's five to four, and Jet Powered seven to one, you know, and Marine Nationals ten to one. It did, what they've achieved and, and what they, you know, um, on, on, on what the figures say, they're just they're just mad prices. So even though, because like I I'm a massive fan of Fasal Vega, it's it's just a, it's just a silly price. Um, <laughs> the 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 other quality time figure that we've got is Gaelic Warrior. Now, this was a real difficult decision I was having to make here, which race I decided to put him up in. I've got to then think of what is going to happen between now and the festival. I'd imagine that they'll stay in the same lane with Fasar Vega. He's entered in the two-mile race over the Christmas period. Whether he runs out of that, I don't know. But I presume they'll go, if they don't, they'll go down the route of running him in the two-mile race on Dublin uh, Racing Festival weekend and stay in his lane. They've also got Chan Keeley, who flopped in the Royal Bond, but he pulled too hard on soft ground, so I still think he could be a two-mile project. So they're very, very strong in that department. Not just all about the two-and-a-half Ballymore route. So there's an opportunity here for, for a Gaelic warrior to slip into that into that category under the radar. And I did go back and look at my, the, the notes of Gaelic Warrior after he got beat in the Boodles. And straight away after that race when he got beat, they said that he'll be back to Cheltenham next year as a novice and he'll run in the Ballymore. Or the Ballymore is going to be the target. So they're giving you that little nugget, you know, almost like 12 months in advance. So then I've looked at, obviously, he's running the Ballymore. He's priced at the Ballymore and he's around about a 10 to 1 chance. So that seems to be more the logical path that they'll go down. He was absolutely amazing the other day at Wexford. Uh, mm-hmm. so Tremor, I know it was a little Mickey Mouse race and he was like 10 to 1 on. I've never seen a horse win so far as that. It was absolutely ridiculous. But the number that he clocked geared down was equivalent to the, Nash, the, the uh, Marine National um, time figure that we got for the Royal Bond. So he basically won very, very close to grade 2, grade 1 standard without coming off the bridle. So this horse has improved considerably from... The, the Boodles when he got beat, when perhaps he shouldn't have got beat, to what we see now. The only negative I could see with him, and I'll put it out there now, is that he did jump to his right when he when he ran in the Boodles. So maybe going left-handed is a problem. I don't know. That might be ironed out in time again. I don't know. But he's a seriously good horse, Gallic Warrior. Uh, and he's just too good for me not to include in this uh, podcast. 
There you go. Second tip from Andy in the Ballymore. Gaelic Warrior at 10 to 1. That's a bet 365 and 888, specifically in the Ballymore, uh, not the Supreme. Uh, Andy, Andy very calmly, like a true professional broadcaster, segueing between the two uh, races there uh, using Gaelic Warrior. Um, but Gaelic Warrior 10 to 1 the second session for him. Fassar Vegas is, is the Ballymore favourite at 5 to 1. Um, Glenn Clare West is 8 to 1. Uh, Hermes Allen uh, 11 to 1. 12 to 1. Marie Nationale. Dawn Rising 14 to 1. Always a bit of a guessing game at this stage of the season as to who goes where, but worth chancing Gaelic Warrior, as Andy says, a bit of a nugget of info from 12 months ago. Uh, and we'll move on to the third um, novice hurdle race of the week, the Albert Bartlett um, over the longest trip. And you've got a selection each here, so I'll pit you up against each other. Um, Grange Clare West is the 6 to 1 favourite with Hidden Valley Lake 8 to 1. American Mike 12 to 1. Sandor Clejane, you have to help me with the pronunciation here, Ed, uh, is the six to one, uh, 16 to one fourth favourite. I think was a bigger price when you initially uh, put him up, but uh, shortened since then. But Ed, uh, 16 to one, your selection in the, uh, in the Albert Bartlett. Yes, I'll go with Sandor Clegane. Uh, we're probably both wrong here, George. To be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, again, it was one of those where I, I harp on about the half the battle with the, the Chatham anti post dynamics changed so much in the last five, six years. Uh, muddied waters, so many horses with multiple entries. Just getting the horse to the right race is often you're beating the market tenfold, which never used to be the case a decade, decade or so ago. So uh, Sandor Clegane. Um, the, the form of that Galway maiden hurdle is working out a treat. I mean, his bumper form, you look back at it, funnily enough, it all just complements Fasal Vega. Uh, it was beaten 12 legs by Fasal Vega at the Dublin Racing Festival uh, in that bumper. And then in the grade one winner, uh, grade one bumper at Pudgestown was, was lapped by Fasal Vega in that. But um, nonetheless, this all stepped up in trip to uh, an extended 2-5 last time out. Absolutely dotted up. I mean, it, it was it was a canter. I remember sitting there going, what is this? I couldn't believe how it just travelled so strongly, just uh, found everything just happening uh, just a bit easier up in distance and jumped well and came home, yeah, 12 lengths hard held on the bridle. Now you can, you can pick holes in a form like you always can. That um, Demand driving Duvan, who was the even money favourite, uh, I think ran, did probably did run a bit below par on that occasion, but nonetheless, maybe he was just made to look average by... Uh, a really impressive performance. Now, it's always the, the, the quotes in the aftermath. And Paul Nolan, uh, within 45 seconds of um, being interviewed, you, you know, you, you get these kind of diplomatic responses sometimes, don't you? And oh, we'll, we'll go back and we'll see how he is and check his legs and regroup and make a plan. And he basically looked down the camera and said, one run, Albert Bartlett. Thanks. Cheers. Have a good night. So, uh, again, uh, to me, that just screams, you know, you've got a horse being targeted for a race. I, I'd be mm. shocked if he's one of these horses that's got, a, you know, uh, an entry in 93 different races when it comes to the festival. And he just he just looked the better he further he went. And that was up to just shy of 2.6. I'll say he was only really starting to hit top gear in the final furlong. Um, it sounds like he's going to be trained to the minute, all roads lead into three miles. Uh, at the Charter Festival. Paul Nolan as well, bit of an underrated trainer. You know, when he gets a good one, he can get the job done. Obviously, he's had Charter Festival winners in the past. Was it Noble Prince, I think? And John Cole was a very good horse for him. He didn't win at the festival, but ran some really good races in Grey One Company. You know, he's a he's he's a bit of a shrewdy, Paul Nolan. I just think this Sandor Club game, again, it's one of those where, you know, I love it when the trainer's already coming out and saying that. It, to me, that just it, it's going to take something really funny to happen to deter them from that plan as opposed to being open to options. So they seem single minded in it. The way he improved the further he went suggests uh, three miles, I think, be well within his grasp. Whether that's kind of Christmas time, I think they were kind of insinuating um, they put him away and bring him back for the Dublin Racing Festival. There's a three mile novice there. We'll go from there. Onto the festival. So yeah, Sandor Clegane was twenty-five to one actually uh, mm. a couple of days ago. Georgia has been nibbled at, and I'm not surprised. It's just in a say in an anti-post markets now, which is just full of trip wires. Uh, you do have to take connections, comments, perhaps with more authority than you used to, uh, because it's the only way to try and decipher where these horses are going now. The trainer said we're going to train him for the Albert Bartlett. That'll do for me. I just think he's very, very exciting. Yeah, 16 to 1. Uh, best price now for Sandor Clegane. Um, pretty much across the board, that one is. Uh, it's Ed's selection. And in the same race, uh, Hidden Valley Lake uh, is one for you, Andy, for Henry de Bromhead. We saw winning yesterday. Yeah, this is basically just parachuted into my list. I, I'd got three, but I, I had to put this fellow in because um just massively impressed with him yesterday. It was a good race, that was. Um, 
they were in a proper gallop. Think of Gordon Elliott's uh, made the run in. Um, ended up finishing third. Uh, sorry, second, beg your pardon. Uh, cool survivor. Um, and it, I like the fact that he was just a little bit off the bridle or behind the bridle turning for home. But he found tons of pressure. And that's the kind of horse that often wins the Albert Barley. You don't want to fancy Dan that can travel on the bridle for a long way. You have to have a grinder. You have to have a horse that stays really well. So he's proven over three miles on soft ground at graded level already. And I do like, similar to what Ned just mentioned about trainer comments and targeting races, he's already said that he's going to go to the Clonmel race that he used before when Monolay uh, won it, before he went on to finish second in the Albert Barley. And Manila Indo finished second to Alaho, if you remember. Um, mm-hmm. Before he went on to turn the form around in the Albert Bartlett. So it's, he knows what it takes to win the Albert Bartlett and what kind of horse and where and where to run them prior to um, the, the festival. So it's a nice natural gap now between, I think it's the early part of February, isn't it, that race at Clonmel, that grade three. Um, so it gives him a nice little month and a half, um, so, uh, you know, um, hiatus between now and then. Um, and that's the perfect timing then to Cheltenham is another month before Cheltenham. Whereas I think the Dublin Foot Racing Festival, that, that two mile six race that I think Galliard de Mesnil won last year, it, it tends to come a little bit too soon for um, for horses. It, they, they, they can't be quite recover in time. I think that race has, hasn't thrown up the winner, has it, of the Albert Barley, even though it's the, the preeminent grade one, isn't it, prior to the festival. Um, I think it probably takes more out, out of horses than it than it it, um, it meets on the eye. So... I wouldn't get too carried away with that trial, whereas other inverted commas trials that are a little bit lower in grade might actually mean more. Um, going back to Ed's horse, I actually did a bit of research on him. Obviously, I was paying attention to what Ed was tipping. Uh, I was very impressed with him that day as well because he beat a horse of uh, Gordon Elliott's, um, who was very strongly fancied that day, finished fourth. But unfortunately, the time figure was pretty pretty lukewarm. That, that guy, and it doesn't mean to say that he can run quicker. I'm sure he can. He's a, he's a he's a decent horse, but I think he did a 41 or a 42 time figure, which is way short of graded level. Whereas this fella yesterday did a proper graded time. Like a, you know, you, you know, I've been doing these for years. I know exactly what they mean, and and um, and and it, it it usually announces they are very good horses and they are great, genuine graded uh, graded performers. And this fella's already proven it. So Hill Valley Lad at eight to one from a stable and a setup that likes to have these kind of horses in that race uh, would be my uh, number one choice in the Albert Bartlett. Well, my only choice in the Albert Bartlett. We don't have time, sadly, to give Ed the right reply to that, um, you know, ferocious uh, de- declaration of war from Andy. But we'll have to move <laughs> on. Um, but before we quickly, before Andy, because we don't have time to talk about the triumph or the or the mayor's uh, novice, really. Just Lucia is the four to one favourite for the mayor's novice that stands at the moment. You think probably the target, um, given yeah. the picker that you've got, would, would that appeal? Yeah, she's the best filly. That, sorry, filly mayor that we've seen in that category. Um, likely to improve as well. It's really taken with her performance at Newbury. Everything about that run was great. A jumping. For a horse to run in that that level first time out, to jump the way she did, to travel the way she did, to beat the right horses as well, uh, in the time figure she did, she's got to be very, very good. And but you know, she we know that she's comfortable under all mm. conditions. You know, she won on heavy ground at Sandown, that takes some doing and the way she stayed on that day. She's got the pace to handle good ground, which she won on in Newbury. Yeah, the sky's the limit for her. I I, I couldn't put anyone off back in Lucia anti post. Even though it wouldn't be Ed's cup of tea at four to one, but there'll be many out there look at that and think, well, you know, a, a horse that could be six to four on the day. So you yeah, know, there's two ways of looking at it. Four to one, Lucia. Um, we've got a, a selection each from you to come, uh, but we'll quickly touch on the novice uh, chases. Um, we, we're not, we don't have time to go through all the races, uh, of course, but we've got. Uh, of course, John Bon, uh, who is six to four favourite for the Arkle, um, and you know plenty of other novice chases over the course of the week. Anything you want to flag up, Ed? Any any selections or horses that have impressed you so far this season in their novice uh, chasing? Yeah, I'm being a proper hipster here. I really am losing the plot, but um, yeah, I've been ploughing <laughs> into the National Hunt uh, National Hunt chase uh, mm. over the last couple of months. Uh, chemical Energy, I, I, I think personally. Galliard de Manil, I think, is a bit of a false favourite. But I, I've just got this feeling that there's something not, how should I say, I don't say he's ungenuine, but he's not from six over fences. Admittedly, he's been dining at the top table behind the likes of Lompress and Bob Ollinger and all these horses, and I get it. Uh, it 
three miles, six furlongs round Cheltenham, it's not really a test of class necessarily. It's a little bit more of a slugfest. I'm not sure that's really going to suit him. And he just keeps um, getting shorter and shorter for standing in his box, Galliard de Menil. And obviously it was a game. It was a good running defeat behind uh, Mighty Potter last time out. And everyone says, oh, an inadequate trip. Well, I think we're being made to think that's an inadequate trip because he's favourite for the for the National Hunt Chase. All in all, I think Chemical Energy is, is the one to be with here. It was a 61-length romp at Cheltenham's October meeting, and uh, it did make me chuckle um, with Gordon Elliott in, in the interview afterwards saying, yeah, all the team were on at 66s for the National Hunt Chase. Uh, they've all got on early doors. And I did laugh, but I, I think this is a perfect race for him. He just looks... Uh, a relentless galloper uh, is all I could say. And they've taken, funny enough, the exact same uh, route they did with Galvin going back a couple of years ago where they brought Galvin over for the October meeting. He won the same race. Um, Gordon Elliott got a lot of stick when he said, no, we're going to put him away and bring him back to the Charlton Festival in, in five months' time. And he's going to be absolutely bubble-wrapped. And, um, wow, well, again, I think I think Galvin was about 12-1 to 1 after that. He went off 7-2 or whatever and got the job done. And I just see a lot of similarities here. It's the same path. It's a it's a tried and tested method. Normally, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm going totally mad getting involved in an amateur jockey's race uh, four months in advance. But I generally just think, as we saw in this race last year, George, it cut up to, what, five runners or something. Um, small fields aren't a shock in these novice chases anymore. He's going straight to the race. He's nine to one. You're hoping he, he's bubble wrapped and doesn't do a leg stood in his box over the next 12 weeks. And I just something about that favourite Galliard de Manil. He keeps losing. And everyone says, yeah, but he was running against some really good horses. You wait until he runs in the National Hunt Chase. I'm not sure three miles six is, is really what he wants. I think he's just a one of those horses. He's going to be very hard to place. Anyhow, chemical energy is going to be trained in a minute for it from a tried and tested method and trainer who knows what he's doing. And um, the horse is crucially brought over to give him Cheltenham experience and uh, he seemed to thrive on it. Well, he won by 61 lengths. So yeah, mm. chemical energy for me, uh, that is my, um, that's my only involvement in any of the novice chases so far. Nine to one, uh, best, pr- best price with bet three, six, five chemical energy there um, for the national hunt chase. Andy, your, your final selection comes in the mayor's chase, um, but I will give you, I'll just give you the floor, really. Uh, any other horses you want to flag up uh, and, th- and then you can take us away, give us the final selection in that uh, race yeah. on Friday. I'll just give a general overview of what, what we've got so far regards figures. I can actually give a thumbs up this time for, for Ed's chemical energy, um, despite Phew. not having much in the way of opposition if, ahead of him at Cheltenham when he won. He, he still clocked a big number, you know, and he was obviously geared down to do so. So he's obviously got a fair engine. I, I couldn't put anyone off Ed's pick there. I think there's a you know, really good sense behind that. Um, Galliard de Mesno, he, he's, a, he, yeah, he's a funny one. I, I've always liked this horse. And I put him up the other day in, in the Dridmore, even though he's dropping back to two and a half, because I just thought, well, he's a class horse and he'll, he'll travel and he jumps. And that's the one thing he does do in abundance. Goodness me, I, I haven't seen a round of jumping as good as that for a long time. He, he was just spring heeled at every single fence and, Oh, I must admit, I thought he was going to win easily going down to the second last. And to be fair to Mighty Potter, he found plenty for pressure. They were well clear of some good horses. That Drinmore this year was an absolute stellar heat. The time was great. The right horses were involved. I know he lost um, um, three strike line because of that bad mistake. And, and, and you know, I don't, I don't think we should be writing him off just yet. Um, but that was the only sort of thing that spoiled, you know, the form line. Other than that, it was just a really good race. I mean, don't forget, Galliard de Mesno was third in the Irish National last year. He was a novice behind Lord Lariat, so he does stay that trip as well. So he's going to be fascinating to see how Galliard de Mesnil's campaign pans out, um, whether he ends up going to Cheltenham or maybe, maybe the Grand National. I, I just don't know with him. Um, he's just very good. So um, I, I hopefully one of them, he'll get his day in the sun. Mighty Potter's obviously very good. The other ones we've got good figures for, a classic getaway when he beat Mimela Kakuna at um, Gowran. Um, the other Saturday. Um, the first race on the car, but Mene Kakuna went a real good ca- uh, gallop over two and a half. Amazingly, he just got run out of it later, but I, I put that down to the ground being props a little bit too heavy for him. But you look at his form against a nice guy, not only at uh, Punchestown, but uh, Cheltenham last year on better ground. I think if he gets his good ground or goodish ground throughout the course of the season, he's going to be very dangerous between two and a half, three miles. Again, I don't know which category he'll end up in, whether he goes down the Turner's route or the, the brand advisory, but he's very good. Um, and the other one I'd mentioned as well, just for the North, I'll fly the flag for the North, Crystal Glory. 
uh, horse from Nicky Richards is that won at Hexham um, again the other week. He clocked a really big time figure for a, a race of that nature when he won. And Nicky Richards has gone on record to think that, or to say that that's his best horse in his yard. And don't forget, he ran really well at Aintree last year for an inexperienced horse. He, he hadn't really been in, in, in deep. Um, but, you know, he came out of his race at Aintree in great credit, finishing fourth in a grade one. So he's got grade one form over hurdles. I'm, I'm pretty convinced he's a grade one horse over fences. But again, at what level, whether he's good enough to beat the Mullins and Gordon Elliott's horses in this world, I wouldn't know. But I think he'll make A up north. Uh, but getting on to my um, selection um, from the novice category, and if she does go down this route, um, then I think she'll go very close to winning the Mayor's Chase, and that's impervious. A horse who won at Wexford yesterday, beating Dino Blue. Now, Dino Blue had already won at Cork, making all the running on her chasing debut. And she got a solo up front yesterday. Um, and impervious basically tracked her and, and outstayed her. And I came away thinking, God, she must be a good mare to beat Dino Blue in the way she did. She was really strong at the finish. She looked for all the world as though she wants further than two miles. She jumped incredibly well for a novice. That was only her second run over fences, but she never put a foot wrong. And she never put a foot wrong at a very strong pace as well. That Dino Blue was trapping along. So much so that she ran the fast. They both ran a faster circuit time and overall than an ergamin yesterday. So we're, we're dealing with two very good novices there. And you look at that 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 mare's category, the likes of Scarlet and Dove and Ellie May, they all beat each other like week in, week out. And there's no real like improvement to come from those horses where I do think Impervious is, is still going to keep uh, progressing. So she's another one I'd, I want to highlight at her current price because I think she's going to be a major contender come next year in the, in the festival. So Impervious <laughs> is my final choice. There we have it, impervious. Uh, seven to one, Skybet, Paddy's, uh, 888 Sport, Betfair Sportsbook there for the Mayor's Chase. Uh, to recap then, um, Ed's three bets uh, we had. Um, Blue Lord for the Ryanair, uh, Chemical Energy uh, for the National Hunt Chase and Sandor Clegane, uh, however you want to say it, in the Albert Bartlett. Andy, uh, Gaelic Warrior in the Ballymore, um, Hidden Valley Lake in the Albert Bartlett, Protector out for the Gold Cup and Impervious for the Mayor's Chase. Uh, thank you very much to both Andy and to Ed for sharing their early thoughts on the Cheltenham Festival 2023 in this bumper Odds Checker betting show. Uh, do download the Odds Checker app where you can find all the best prices across the Cheltenham Festival and racing uh, every single day, as well as bookie offers, free bets, uh, the best place terms, and Andy's bets straight to the app every single morning of racing. Uh, I'm up for it now, guys. You've got me excited yeah. about Cheltenham and it's mid-December, so I'm going to go and... Uh, you know, that that meme of somebody throwing the, the thing and it's, you know, my wages at Cheltenham Festival. That's what I'm going to start doing now, uh, getting involved. Um, but yeah, cheers to you both. Uh, and we'll, we'll speak again very, very soon. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, do subscribe to the Odds Checker YouTube channel uh, where you can find plenty more Odds Checker betting shows every week and racing weekly, uh, weekly as well. And you can find this on any podcast channel too. Uh, enjoy the racing. Hopefully some good insight there ahead of the festival. Uh, please do ensure that you're gambling responsibly.